I've just got myself a Chinese CO2 laser cutter. It was overwhelming at times, so that's why I've made this complete buyer's guide. I really like designing and making things, and as such, I'm always looking to expand my manufacturing capabilities. Recently, I did a multi-part series building a Lowrider 2 mostly printed CNC, and that worked great. What wasn't so great was a diode laser that I reviewed that I intended for that machine, and especially what came afterwards. The truth did come out in the end, but my plans for a large format laser cutter were ruined, especially after I invested a lot of time and money. Therefore, I made the decision to buy a Chinese CO2 laser cutter. When I was researching, there were so many around and it truly was overwhelming. So I decided to make this buyer's guide to help others in the same situation. So far, I'm happy with my purchase, but in this area of Chinese laser cutters, I'm definitely still a novice. I'm gonna be showcasing a great bunch of resources that will help you in your journey. And if you've got any more, please leave them in the comments below. There are some important safety considerations throughout this video, so please make sure to watch the whole thing if you're using it as a resource. Let's start by looking at what these machines are and breaking them down component by component. Previously on the channel, I'd covered diode lasers. The diode is an oversized version of what you'll find in a laser pointer. The advantages of these is they're small and lightweight, which means you can mount them to custom built frames or even to 3D printers. The disadvantages are safety because they're not enclosed for smoke or eye protection and also a lack of power as they stop at about five to 10 watts. What we're dealing with in this video is a CO2 laser and the laser is emitted from a large glass tube at the back of the machine. A series of mirrors is then used to bounce the output of the laser to the cutting head. The first mirror is at the output of the laser tube and bounces it into the middle of the machine. The second mirror moves with the Y axis and bounces it towards the laser head. And the final mirror receives this and reflects it 90 degrees downwards into a lens. If we were to visualize the path, it would look like this. And if the mirrors are aligned, it doesn't matter where the carriage is traveling, it'll always reflect the same way and end up at the cutting head. We have to show this in a diagram because the wavelength of light emitted is infrared and therefore invisible to the human eye. The most popular type of Chinese CO2 laser is nicknamed the K40, with 40 standing for 40 watts. 40 watts far exceeds what you'll get on a diode laser and the different wavelength means you can cut through things like timber as well as clear acrylic. The working area is only 300 by 200 and they are only a few hundred dollars, but buying them can be a gamble. There's a lot of shoddy examples around that need a lot of tinkering to get to work. I ended up with this one. It's a much larger machine with some nice features, but it's essentially from the same type of family as the K40. I wanted the biggest cutting area I could without taking up too much space in the room, so I was particularly happy with the one meter wide cutting area as well as the 80 watt laser tube output. So how did I navigate through the seemingly endless list of lasers for sale? Well, I did a lot of reading of some great resources. K40s are very popular for hobbyists, and here are three of the best websites that I found. They're linked in the description below, and they're a treasure trove of useful information for K40 and bigger lasers. We have k40laser.se, lasergods.com, and donsthings.blogspot.com. Let's work our way through the elements that we need to check when we're shopping for a Chinese laser. Probably the first thing that you should be aware of is the cutting area. There is an associated naming convention that makes sense most of the time, apart from on lasers like myself, where 1040 is a meter by 400, where you might have expected it to be 100 by 400. It seems pretty obvious, but the price of the machine is going to go up with the working area. Once you know the size you're after, you can use this naming convention to narrow down your search results. However, you should still verify the specifications of that exact unit by searching in detail through the description. The vertical height we'll cover in detail later. Another differentiator in price is the motion system. The cheaper lasers, like those pictured on the left, have bearings that glide on round hardened rods. Whereas if you're willing to spend more money, you might find a machine with genuine high wind linear rails. Now onto the actual laser tube. And this might be the biggest make or break component of the whole machine. The tube in my laser is a recce, and the sticker says 102 watts, although the machine is meant to be 80. Another sticker has the model as W2 and the agreed power as 90 watts. Finally, there's a QR code which takes me to their website for verification. 
On the website, we will learn what's going on. The test current is 29 milliamps, but the maximum working current is meant to be below 27, and the tube will actually last many hours if we keep it below 25. For my machine, fortunately it wasn't hard to find the truth. But for many of these cheaper machines, they can be quite misleading and you can't actually run them at 40 watts. It's not uncommon for manufacturers to overstate their laser power. But with a bit of digging, you can find the dimensions of typical laser tubes. Sometimes you'll have machines claiming to be 80 watts, but the whole machine is actually narrower than the laser tube should be. It is common to have these bulging sections to handle a longer tube, so check and account for that too. Another tip is to ask for a picture of the power supply, because quite often they're rated for less than the actual laser tube in the advertisement. Another really important component is the laser control system electronics. The most expensive and generally agreed is the best is the Ruida controller on the right. Commonly found on K40s and other cheap machines, however, is the M2 Nano and derivatives. The listing for such a machine might often say things like Coral Draw. Cheap M2 Nano boards don't have their own controller, but rather a digital or analog panel. And for reasons you'll see later in the video, you definitely want the analog panel. There's a great article on laser gods explaining exactly why. So you might think you can just stick to a laser that has an actual control panel like a Rowita, but it's just not that simple. There's also a great page on laser gods that goes through all of the control systems you're likely to find and tells you how hard they are to get decent software to work with them. As for my machine, it had the B1 variant of the M2 Nano and the digital control panel. Worst of the worst, but I liked the rest of the machine and it gave me a chance to do some upgrade videos on this channel. On the supplied CD with the machine was cracked Coral Draw software and another program called LaserDraw, which is universally condemned as unreliable and useless. A far superior piece of software for the Nano board is K40 Whisperer. It's free and you don't require the physical dongle to use it. Those glass laser tubes need adequate cooling to have a reasonable lifespan. We need to have cold water circulating around them at all times and there's three main options. K40s and other cheap machines are likely to just come with an aquarium pump and then you source your own bucket. The next step up is a CW3000 chiller, at least in terms of convenience. Despite the name chiller, they're not actually refrigerated, which means they can only cool the laser to ambient temperature at best. If your laser will be in a warm room or you're planning to do extended cutting, this might not be the best option for you. Our final and most expensive option is the CW5000 or CW5200 chiller. Unlike the others, this actually has its own refrigeration built in. But of course it's not that simple because people sell counterfeit products that don't work as well. This guide is linked in the description. Our next component is air assist and the cheaper lasers probably won't come for them. People disagree on the best way to implement it, but everyone seems to agree that you should have it. Here's a really crude example. When I manually fire the laser without air assist on, you can see that the smoke and flames are free to go up and dirty the lens. With air assist on, even though I'm still charring the same piece of timber, the flames do not lift up and the smoke is not free to go up and dirty the lens either. The bonus is you usually get a much cleaner cut from air assist as well. My unit came with the air compressor pictured on the right, but I'd already spent money on the much bigger one on the left. Now I'll have to test them back to back to determine the best one. We need to get the smoke out of the machine, and most K40s come with a separate exhaust fan and some pretty cheap and nasty tubing that most people agree is a waste of time. My laser comes with an integrated fan, but still with the cheap and nasty tubing, and I'll be working hard to improve this setup. Early testing suggests I might need an additional inline fan because it's just not clearing the smoke fast enough in this situation. Let's talk about the bed, and most small cutters like a K40 have this really weird clamping system that has no vertical movement. It is common, however, for many people to add their own motorized Z-axis table to account for different thickness materials. Whatever the case, you want the bed material to be aerated like the mesh system on mine. If you find a laser with a vertical measurement for the Z-axis, it means it should have a motorized table. Mine is very simple, it has an up button and a down button and it is agonizingly slow. Stare at one spot to check that this is actually moving, but I guess that's better than nothing. Let's finish up with extras, and it's really important to have safety switches around the machine. This switch was wired up for me to cut the power to the whole machine, but I changed it to cut the power to the laser only. If I lift up the lid, the laser stops protecting my eyes, but the exhaust fan and the lights stay on. My cutter also came with the very welcome addition of a water flow sensor. To put it simply, the laser simply will not fire unless it detects that coolant is flowing through the tube. 
Finally, the best extra mine came with was a rotary axis. When you connect it instead of the Y axis, it allows you to engrave on round things, which will take the capabilities of your machine to a whole new level. Now here's some things you might not think of, and that's getting a machine that will actually fit through your door. Some machines have leg sections that are detachable and others do not, so please double check. As you can see, the crate for my laser was absolutely enormous. But part of the reason I went with this machine was its large cutting area and the fact that it fits through a standard doorway when up on its side. Not all machines come with casters, so depending on the size of the unit and your room, you might want to double check this also. Lucky last, shipping, and it can be a massive pain. You'll need to research the import duties and taxes for your country, and also check whether the shipping actually goes to your door or just to the local port where you need to take care of things yourself. Based on this and the fact that there's a fragile glass tube inside, I strongly recommend buying yours from your own country. I got mine from a seller two hours away from me on Gumtree, which is the Australian version of Craigslist. All of their listings were only CNC equipment. This is something to check for, as if your seller sells one laser cutter and then a bunch of random other things, there's a good chance they're not going to be very experienced with these units, unable to answer questions, and probably not be able to offer good after-sales support. Hopefully that gives you enough knowledge to know what you're looking for and then to make an informed decision if you decide to go ahead with a purchase. Before you start cutting, there are some things you need to get right to preserve both your machine and yourself. So let's get started by looking at safety considerations. Your new laser cutter might attempt to kill you in a number of ways, but perhaps the worst is by electric shock. Parts of the machine are controlled by mains voltage, and then there's the laser power supply, which outputs close to 20,000 volts. I would strongly recommend not touching anything in here unless you know exactly what you're doing, and if you do tinker, unplug it from the wall when you open the case. Those built-in power outlets on the back are considered a no-go, and if your power point doesn't have an earth pin, make sure to earth the machine with the supplied terminal. The next major problem is the threat of damage to your eyes. During normal operation, the machine is sealed and you're safe to watch through. However, sometimes you might need to test fire with the lid open, such as aligning mirrors, so you'd be crazy not to invest in the small amount of money for the appropriate glasses. If a laser can cut through timber, it can definitely damage your skin. Remember that the laser is invisible, but it is present. If you were to swipe your hand through here, it's going to burn your skin badly. Hence why it's important to fit a safety switch to kill the laser when the lid is opened. Next, we have smoke and fumes, and everyone expects the smoke to stink from burning timber, but attempting to cut other materials might release toxic gases. Please do your homework before attempting any new materials. Finally, there are moving parts, so I suppose there's a chance of getting your fingers caught somewhere in the machine. Once again, leaving the lid shut should avoid this. With all of this covered, we can now start to prepare the machine, and you have lots of trivial tasks such as cutting cable ties and peeling off the protective backing from the windows. This type of thing is honestly one of my worst skills in life. Before we fire the laser, we need to fill up the cooling system, and it's extremely important to put in a mix that's not conductive and going to arc your laser. Laser Gods has a great article and I followed it using distilled water, a tiny bit of detergent and some biocide to kill fungus. Distilled water is cheap and 10 litres is more than enough to fill up a CW3000. Knowing I needed my current under 25 milliamps, I didn't fire my laser until I had fitted an ammeter. These are pretty cheap and one that goes up to 30 milliamps was sufficient for my type of laser. The digital panel is a glorified potentiometer. It turns the laser power up and down, but it's displayed as a percentage. So the question is a percentage of what? This unknown is why it's essential to fit an analog ammeter. I followed a nice guide on Don's blog, finding the correct return wire from the laser tube and then insulating the hell out of it with some hot glue afterwards. My target was 22 to 23 milliamps and I needed 50% set on the digital panel to achieve this. It's lucky I didn't put it straight to 80 and assume it was all good. Not only are the digital panels lacking in information, but they're said to be unreliable, so I decided to replace it completely. I used Don's blog to identify my laser power supply and work out the pinout, and then followed a wiring diagram from k40laser.se for a precision potentiometer. I always like my mods to be reversible, therefore I made up a custom plug to match the pinout of the factory display, and then I have a precision 10 turn potentiometer to replace all of the digital buttons on the old panel. The laser test fire button is replaced by a similar momentary switch 
but instead of an LED, I went for a buzzer. In a future video, you'll see more of how I designed and 3D printed this custom front panel, but for now, everything is working beautifully. The new potentiometer is extremely precise and allows you to get exact measurements. We're getting close, but we still need to align our mirrors. There's an amazing guide on k40laser.se, but if you prefer to follow a video, this gem just came out in the last week or so and goes through everything patiently step by step. My final step was determining my focal length. In practical terms, this ends up being the correct distance from the laser to the workpiece. My focal length was meant to be 50mm, but remember it is from the lens, partially inside, not the very tip of the air assist nozzle. There's a really simple procedure you can do to get this exact, and it involves laying a piece of wood on a shallow angle underneath the laser. On low power, you then etch a series of straight lines or a square edge zigzag like I did, going across the angled piece. The etched line should go from thick to very fine to thick again as it comes in and then out of focus. You can move the laser above the finest line and then pack a series of thin objects underneath, which you can then remove and measure with some vernier calipers. The gap I needed from the nozzle to the workpiece was 6mm, so I simply glued together two 3mm pieces of acrylic. Now at the start of the job, I can simply raise and lower the table until this tool just fits underneath. Finally, I had everything in place to start some test work. Except I had a major hurdle and the footage you're seeing here is taken after I did the fix. Do you remember how I said buying one of these machines is always going to be somewhat of a gamble? Well, in my particular unit, the laser control board refused to connect to any of my computers. I couldn't even get as far as installing a driver, so it's effectively bricked for me. But that's okay, because all along I plan to upgrade the nano board to one from Cohesion 3D so I can run Lightburn. Like 3D printers, these are definitely machines for tinkerers, and there's a lot of upgrade paths available, so you can expect to see step-by-step -step guide on how I did this enormous improvement in a future video. Thank you so much for watching, and until next time, happy laser cutting. G'day, it's Michael again. If you liked the video, then please click like. If you want to see more content like this in future, click subscribe and make sure you click on the bell to receive every notification. If you really want to support the channel and see exclusive content, become a patron. Visit my Patreon page. See you next time.